لما يا مخلوق آثرت الجحود كنت معدوما فمن أين الوجود آهي الصدفة أم رب الودود آهي الصدفة أم رب الودود أبنه في الكون من بعده الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين Welcome again my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, my dear viewers to another wonderful uh, program that we have here this course is on the tafsir and the commentary of the Holy Quran and as we begin I would like to greet you with the Islamic greeting of peace by saying Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May the peace, the blessings and the mercy of Allah be with each and every one of you So we have started for some weeks now Surah Qaf and we had be, uh, we started with the very beginning verses and we have come down to the end of the surah the last few verses we are in at present and uh, the last verse that we touched on which we were actually discussing and given the commentary of it is verse 38 of surah qaf and in that uh, verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned and he says, Indeed, we created the heavens and the earth and all between them in six days and nothing of fatigue touched us. The Arabic, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillahi rahman rahim Allah says, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا فِي سِتَّةِ عَيَّامِ And certainly, we created the heavens, the skies, والأرض, and the earth. وما بينهما, and whatever is between both the heavens and the earth. We created, Allah says, and when he says we, he refers to his own self, him. في ستة أيام, in six days. And then he says, وما مسنا من لغوب. And nothing touched us of what? لغوب, يعني fatigue or tiredness. And we mentioned the backdrop or the background against which this verse was revealed. It was about where once the Jews came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they spoke to him about how many days Allah created the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them and how many days and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned to, him, to them about uh, what Allah created uh, um, on the first day and the second day and etc. And then when he mentioned about uh, the last thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did, they said you would have spoken the truth if you had completed it. If you had completed it. And then he says, what do you mean? They said then Allah reclined on the throne and Allah took a rest on the seventh day. They said that. So, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became angry with them for saying that and upon that Allah revealed this ayah of the Holy Quran making it very clear that yes Allah created the heavens and the earth and every single thing between the heavens and the earth in six days but six days you know remember the Holy Quran says one day of the hereafter is equal to thousands of years of this world so a day in the sight of Allah is not a day for us here a day for us is 24 hour period It's measured with the you know um the system that we have on the face of the earth but what it refers to is in six different periods and if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it in six periods of time that is what it means six different periods of time not necessarily not at all the day that we have in, which we know in this world 24 hour period Per day, and uh, but Allah so Allah created it in six days, yani six different periods of time, but He did not rest on the seventh day. Uh, that only that being needs rest who becomes tired, who becomes fatigued, who becomes exhausted, who becomes exhausted, and these uh, things do not come upon Allah. Allah cannot become tired. Allah cannot become. This is why uh, Ayatul Kursi condemns that action. La ta'khuluhu sinatun wa la naum. That drowsiness, tiredness, and, and weariness doesn't come upon Allah. And sleep doesn't come upon Allah. So that's the backdrop of this. And we were explaining that. So further to the explanation, it is mentioned under the commentary of that same verse 38 which we have to continue from today it states the above verse establishes 
that Allah created the heavens and earth and all that is in them in the heavens and the earth and everything between the heavens and the earth in six days. It actually mentions that. We believe that. But he did not become tired and fatigued. As such, it is totally false for one to say that he rested on the seventh day because they believe he became tired uh, on account of the work. So therefore, if a person says that Allah or in his own language, God, God became tired, then it means that you believe your God is just like a human being. <laughs> What's the difference between you and your God? If you become, you become tired and he becomes tired, and then the belief goes further that you have to feed your God. That what's the difference if you, you become hungry and your God becomes hungry? He needs food and you need food. He needs drink and you need drink. You need drink. No. God is above those qualities of human being. The Khaliq, the creator, is far beyond and above uh, those uh, situations and states and ahwal that come upon human beings or any other makhluk. This is the di big difference between the khaliq and the makhluk. The makhluk and the creation, all of the entire creation, they are totally dependent upon the khaliq who is the creator. They are in need. They are in need for food and drink and for nourishment and for life and for, for every single thing. The makhluk is like that. They work and they become tired and they need a rest. They wake for a long period. They become drowsy. They fall asleep and they go to sleep. But the khaliq and Allah is not like that. In all these passages, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates every single thing that these people said about Allah. When they said that Allah has taken a son. Allah has a son. Someone is born from Allah. Surah Ikhlas was revealed in which Allah refuted what the people were saying when he said, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lan yalid wa lam yulad. Wa lam yakul lahu kufu wan ahad. Say, he is Allah. Huwa Allahu. He is Allah. Ahad. One and alone. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. He is totally independent, as samad wonderful quality of Allah, has no need for anything, has no need for anybody, not dependent on anything or anybody, as samad independent. Lam yalid, subhanallah, lam yalid wa lam yulad, he did not give birth to anyone, nor was he born from anyone, and there is no equal, there is no peer, there is no one like him, subhanallah. Very beautiful surah, very powerful surah, which is known as surah ikhlas. That's the surah of Qul Allahu ahad. Now, so here, they said Allah needed a rest. Allah says no. He doesn't stand in need of a rest. And that, that is exactly what is evident here. In the verse, Allah says at the end of the verse, that he created the heavens and the earth in six days. And after that, at the end, he says, وَمَا مَسَّنَا مِنْ لُغُوبِ And nothing of tiredness and fatigue touched us. That's why it says in the Shara and the commentary here, it says, what in the verse Allah says, وَمَا مَسَّنَا مِنْ لُغُوبِ And nothing of لُغُوبِ, we maintain the Arabic word, nothing of لُغُوبِ, which is translated as fatigue touched us. In other words, we did not become tired and fatigued over doing that. The Arabic word used in the verse is lugub, which is translated as fatigue. However, it has other meanings. There are many different meanings for that same word lugub, like tiredness, weakness, exhaustion, weariness, helplessness, etc. With this understanding, it becomes clear that by creating the heavens and the earth and everything between them, Allah did not become weak. Allah did not become tired. Allah did not become exhausted or helpless. Subhanallah. Such deficiencies and states that are found in the creation cannot come upon Allah and he is far above such states. Subhanallah. Very beautiful commentary as given by the commentators of the Holy Quran. So, by working, 
night and day to accomplish something, to create the huge mountains and the massive oceans and the earth that is well spread out. You can imagine the amount of work that need to be, needed to be done. Look at this whole universe, the skies far above our heads, you know, and the lakes and the mountains, subhanAllah. So if a person thinks about another one who is creating and making and fabricating all these things, you know, uh, and all these different uh, you know, uh, earthly creations were created, then it definitely the human mind begins to think that person must be weak at the end of that. Probably he may have become exhausted after doing all that work. You know, he's now tired, he's helpless, he's weak now. So when people think like that, you are actually thinking that it is a human being who created all these things. For any individual to think that Allah who created all these things became tired, then in your mind you are thinking a, a creation and a human being created these things. But it is Allah who created all these things and he's telling us that after creating these things, yes, it was in six days, but he did not rest on the seventh day. So whatever they believe in the Ahlul Kitab that Allah created the heavens and the earth and wama bainahuma and whatever is between them in six days, yes. But we say six days, not like the day of our world. Six periods of time Allah created the heavens and the earth and all that is between. We, the Quran says that this came from Allah. So it was revealed to Isa alayhi salam. It was revealed to Musa alayhi salam. It is there in their scriptures. It is there in our scriptures, the Holy Quran. But their scriptures, Isa and Musa, like our Quran, didn't say Allah rested. How can Allah say that about himself when he did not rest? And that is not in the Quran also, and that is the truth. It is to be understood that six days mentioned in the verse do not refer to days of this worldly life, which is a fixed duration of time. It's a fixed period of time. Instead, it refers to six phases or periods, the length of which is known only to Allah. Nobody but Allah knows how long a day. When he says six days, he alone knows how long that one day lasted, how long it was for. And we kind of think that it is six days of our world. Surah Qaf, the other, the other verse uh, is mentioned here in Surah Qaf, that's verse 39, and it states, So bear with patience. O Prophet, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so bear with patience all that they say and glorify the praises of your Lord before the rising of the sun and before its setting. Subhanallah, what does the Quran say? Fasbir ala ma yaqulun. So be patient. And uh, this is Amr. Amr, it's an imperative tense. And also, obviously, uh, the second person is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah is saying, Fasbir, ya Nabi, O Prophet, O my Prophet, you be patient. Be patient. Ala ma yaqulun, on what they say. In other words, they are saying things that are blasphemous. They are saying things that are against Allah. They are saying things which they have made up and concocted, which is not the truth. And any person who loves the truth and is a believer of the truth will become angry. And so when they said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala arrested, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became extremely angry. And then they were accusing him of not speaking the truth when he did not say what they wanted to hear. So he became naturally angry because they were lying against him. Unlike that, they said many things that angered him and that were wrong. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear to him and he said, advising the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fasbir, be patient, ala ma yaqulun, on what they say. And then, what should you do, O Prophet? Wasabbih, bihamdi, rabbika, and glorify with the praises of your Lord, sabbaha, is the imperative, imperative, imperative tense of sabbah, sabbah, it means sabbah, and you glorify, glorify, behamd, hamd in praises, rabbika, your Lord, and glorify with the praises of your Lord. When? Qabla tulu'i shamsi, before the rising of the sun, wa qabla al-ghurub, and before the setting. 
Subhanallah. Very beautiful, beautiful, beautiful ayah. That, and this, in this, when we look at it, the scholars have stated that here, Allah is saying to the Prophet, there are many things you will hear that amounts to taunting you, that these people are taunting you. People are mocking you, they are ridiculing you, and they are saying many things to, to upset you and to make you angry. What is the prescription from Allah to deal with that? To deal with that, subhanAllah. What is Allah's prescription to deal with issues like that, that you are doing the writing, you are propagating the truth, you are reaching out the message of Allah, but in every direction, you are hearing tones and you are hearing criticism and you are hearing people condemning you and people lying, fabricating tales about you as a human being. It will affect you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was insanun kamilun, the most, most perfect human being that Allah sent on the face of the earth. He was not a jinn. He was not an angel. Subhanallah. He was the most perfect greatest, highest ranking person that Allah ever created, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi. <clears throat> so, this obviously affected him. In other ayats, Allah said to him, and we know, Prophet, that what they say, it distresses you, it hurts you, it straightens, it brings tightness in your heart. Again, Allah says, but what do you do? You, one, you bear with patience, but what will help remove this feeling, this, this stressful feeling from you, it is the what? Make the tasbih of Allah. Make the dhikr of Allah. When you become, and when the individual and the be believer, he becomes preoccupied with the dhikr of Allah, with the tasbih of Allah, and also his performance of salat, then this will remove all those things from his mind and then his focus will be on something else and then these things will have no effect on him and this is this really when you look at it is is allah is telling the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what to do to overcome what you hear from them and how they treat you so as it is mentioned in this verse, Allah advises his beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to bear with patience what he hears from the statements of the Jews when they said that Allah became tired and rested on the seventh day after creation. He became angry. He is also advised to bear with patience what he hears from the taunts and criticisms, criticism of the polytheists and the unbelievers, the unbelievers, the kuffar and the mushrikeen and to show forbearance when they cause harm to him and the believers. Subhanallah. In other words, that's the first thing Allah says. Fasbir ala ma yaqulun. Whatever they say, it will hurt you, but the first thing you do, be patient. Subhanallah. Be patient. Be patient on that which comes to you, and also show patience and forbearance on what comes to his disciples and his followers and his companions. Bear yeah, with patience, the taunts that come your way also. Many commentators of the Holy Quran have stated that the above instruction to the Prophet ﷺ and believers to have patience upon the sufferings from the unbelievers was later abrogated when the law of jihad was revealed. At that time, Allah granted them the allowance to retaliate and defend themselves against oppression and sufferings which came from the unbelievers, as it is mentioned in the tafsir of Bahr al-Muhit, Qurtubi, and also al-Baghwi. Now, so we have two very beautiful commentaries here because they are actually two different teachings. One is that in the early days, in the Meccan life, the Prophet Wasallam was persecuted, the, and the believers were persecuted, and they, their lives were ended. In other words, they were literally killed for having accepted Islam. They were thrown out of their homes. They were expelled from their, their city, the city of Makkah. They were driven out, you know. And, and men, women, and, chil and, the, and the children, they were brutally persecuted and killed, mercilessly persecuted, you know, at the hands of the unbelievers. And in the beginning period of Islam, the Muslims were few in number. They were in a minority. They were a few in number. And at that time, the law to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that whatever is done to you, keep your hands low, keep your hands tied and do not retaliate. 
and do not speak out against them. Do not retaliate with words and do not retaliate also with your hands. In other words, be patient, be patient. Allah will open a way one day. So for a long period, for, for more than 13 years, they suffered, they were persecuted, persecuted they were tortured only because they became muslims and they believed in one god they believed in that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the believers believed that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the last of all prophets seal of all prophets they followed him they obeyed him and they accepted his teachings but they were persecuted so in the beginning the law the law was that they, the Rasul the, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the, the believers with him could not retaliate. They could not even defend themselves, defend their land or defend their what, houses. They could not even defend their families. They just had to be patient on whatever murders and massacres and killings occurred. They just had to be patient. But then when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to Medina, and the mushrikeen, the polytheists, and the unbelievers in Makkah still did not leave him to live in peace. He left their country. So, I mean, anyone will understand that, okay, well, the person whom you hate so much, he has left. And those people who you hate so much because of their belief, they have left. So you enjoy your land now. <laughs> enjoy your, they have left and you have taken over their land and they have taken over whatever they left, their, their assets. So be happy with that and forget about them. But no. They were so cruel and wicked, they went after them in Medina now. And they even incited the people living in Medina, who were non-Muslims, to go against and even fight the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslims. At that time, Allah revealed in the Holy Quran, Those people who were fought against and they were beaten and they were killed, permission is now granted for them to what? Retaliate. Defend yourselves. Why? Because you have been mazloom, you have been oppressed. You have been treated in an unfair and unjust manner. So when that law came, which allowed them to go to, to battles and to go towards jihad and to defend their iman and to defend their lives and to defend the lives of their family members and their homes and their property and their wealth, now, the first law that was revealed by Allah telling them to just bear with patience and do not retaliate, that law was abrogated. That law was abrogated. And the new law here now was, you have the allowance now. These people have overdone it. They actually continue to, to persecute you and they continue to torture you. You have the right now. That, that time the Muslims had grown in numbers. And that's where the law of jihad came about as it came about during the time of uh, Prophet Musa salam, and even before him at the time of Prophet David and Prophet Suleiman wasalam, and it also came at the time of Prophet Isa salam. The people suffered, suffered, suffered and there came a time when Allah gave them the allowance to protect their, their faith and their religion and their lives. And so too in this case. So according to some commentators, this uh, this uh, ruling here, law, so bear with patience all that they say, you know, it was about one explanation was this was revealed at that time. And then with the coming of the law of jihad, this was abrogated. That's one explanation. But the other explanation was that while that is so, this ayah refers to something that is general. Because even if, even if you are not persecuted by anyone, even if nobody fights you for your religion, even after Islamic beca Islam becoming the dominant religion in the Hijaz region, that's in, in, in Makkah and Medina at the time of the Prophet still, as long as the world continues to exist, you will find people plotting, scheming, designing plans against you. They will taunt you with their tongue. They will criticize you. They will backbite you. They will lie about you. They will fabricate tales about you. They will say things to cause you to become angry, just as in the case. Yeah. So the Jews were not literally fighting the Prophet Wasallam. When we look at the, the cause of the revelation of this ayat, they were saying to him that you are not speaking the truth. You have to speak the truth. And what was their truth? That, okay, 
Allah created everything in six days, but He rested on the seventh day. That's not the belief from the Quran. Neither it is the belief from every real scripture. So the Prophet ﷺ became angry. So this will continue until the day of judgment. Continued at that, it occurred at that time. It continued after that time. And even until today, every single believer will be confronted with situations like that. Where people make up tales. People, what you are saying is the truth. They will consider that to be lies. People will say so many things that will hurt you. So this now, from this angle with this explanation, it is a general teaching until the day of judgment. No abrogation in this teaching. And that Allah is saying that whatever people say to you and they taunt you or they, they say things to hurt you, you know, they say things against the truth and it affects you when you hear things that are fabricated and are lies. And when you hear battle and falsehood, it hurts you. You become angry. What is the teaching? Bear that with patience. And because tones and the other and the harms caused by the tongue affects your heart deeply. And it goes and it begins to rest in the deep recesses, recesses of your heart. You need, sometimes it stresses you out. Allah has given us the what? The cure for that. Make the dhikr of Allah. Glorify Allah. Make the tasbih of Allah. And you begin to remember Allah. In the Quran, Allah says, Ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul qulub. Behold, verily, in the dhikr and remembrance of Allah, do hearts find peace and tranquility. So these things that come from among tones and backbiting and slandering and gossiping and you hear they are coming to you and people say things to actually aggravate you, say things to make you become angry, to hurt you. What does it affect? Not your, your head or your hand or your, your body or your feet. Where, what is affected? Where does it affect? The heart. It goes into the heart. It piles up in the heart. So though you might not be physically sick with any part of your body, you know, the heart becomes affected now. So you, you're always in a sad mood because the heart is affected. So to get that out and to bring the peace and tranquility in the heart and that serenity and goodness and, and that happy feeling in the heart, Allah himself tells us, behold in the dhikr of Allah, do hearts find peace and tranquility and whenever we are in that state where our hearts are affected you know and and and, and we are in that uh, situation then the dhikr of allah is the best cure for that and this is what allah is saying to the prophet first of all be patient on what they say don't fight down anything words against words and there is a battle with words think about it somebody says something to you you say it back to him or her then they say something more and you say something more. And then they add two more words and you add two more words. And it's a tit for tat. When will it end? <laughs> at the end of the day, somebody will, at the end of it, somebody will become violent. Or you walk off, but what was said will affect you. You will remember it for days. You can't sleep in the night. You go to work the next day, it's on your mind. So this is what will you hear. Don't get into any sort of battle with words. You bear with patience, but make the dhikr and the tasbih of Allah. That's the cure for that. The verse further states, And glorify the praises of your Lord before the rising of the sun and before its setting. Subhanallah. So we are asked generally in the Holy Quran, morning and evening, to glorify Allah, to praise Allah. And some of the scholars have stated it refers to salat. But these are two special timings which Allah has mentioned in the Holy Quran. Timings to, besides performing salat, because Fajr is Qablatul Ishamsi, the Fajr Salah is the Salah and it is a great, the greatest form of the Dhikr of Allah before the sun rises. And Asr Salah is Qabla Al Ghurub, it is the Salah before the setting of the sun. Because Maghrib starts after the setting of the sun. So these are the two Salat and a Salat. Obviously, it is the greatest, greatest, greatest form of the dhikr of Allah. In every posture, you are remembering Allah. But besides that, then there is the general dhikr of Allah that you could call Allah's holy name, His great beautiful names with the tongue. It brings about goodness in the life. It brings about the barakat and the thawab. And we are encouraged to do that. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu uthkur Allah dhikran kathira. Or those who believe, uh, remember Allah, do the remembrance of Allah, remembrance of Allah, dhikran kathira. 
a lot in abundance. Allah says, do Allah, Allah is saying, the Quran is saying, do Allah's dhikr in abundance. There is no limit. So here, now these two times are very, very special. These are the times the angels come and the hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari, which is a commentary of the eye of the Holy Quran about the angels take turn and come in. They come at these special times. They come in the masjid, they perform salah, and then they go fajr and asr. Subhanallah. So the, the, the Holy Quran says, and glorify the praises of your Lord before the rising of the sun and before it's setting. The, sta the statement, and glorify the praise of your Lord, includes the act of glory, glorifying Allah by doing tasbih of Allah, the dhikr of Allah, the tasbih, and also includes the act of glorifying and praising him by offering salah. Uh, I see that it's, it's about time for us to take a short break. So we'll take a short break and inshallah after the break we'll continue. I'm Coco, refreshing fruit drink with chewable coconut chunks, delicious flavors of lychee, strawberry, coconut and mango. Beat the heat and restore your energy with I'm Coco. Try this. Yes. I'm Coco. Healthy, never tasted this good. Queen the Courtyard. Modern condominium and hotel accommodations. Specialized for company and commercial use. 100 bedroom units, living room, kitchen, dining, laundry area and parking. Secure and picturesque. Queen D Courtyard, Clifton Hill, Point Fourteen, Telephone Six Four Eight Two Four Eight Nine. Need to replace your windshield? Think about safety. Think about Double Z. At Double Z, we supply OEM quality windshields and OEM adhesives. Our friendly and efficient staff awaits you. Double Z's technicians are internationally certified to bring your vehicle back to factory standard. Relax in our executive lounge while your windshield is being replaced. Free mobile service at your home, office, or repair shop. Visit us at Gasparillo or Valsane or call 645-9585 or 6500093. Double Z, the windshield people. Battery Tire and Muffler Center, distributor of Bridgestone and Firestone Tires, road hazard and quality warranty, plus free roadside assistance. We carry the full line of Hercules truck tires. Came us for the renowned Bosch high-tech sealed maintenance-free automobile batteries with a 36-month gas warranty and 18-month diesel warranty. At our convenient Barataria Center, we offer free oil service with the purchase of any top brand name oil. For all your motoring needs, make Kamas your next stop. Kamas Barataria and Jaguar. Welcome again to the program and the discourse of the tafsir which we have just started. So, as it states here, uh, many commentators of the Holy Quran, we just continued with the commentary. So, we are speaking about the eye of the Quran where Allah says, uh, and glorify the praises of your Lord. And glorify with the praises of your Lord. Before the rising of the sun, and before setting, the setting meaning before it's setting. And as, uh, as we have mentioned in the commentary here, that it includes two things. One is the general dhikr and tasbih of Allah, and also it includes what the act of glorifying and praising Allah by offering salah. 
The commentary says many commentators of the Holy Quran have adopted the second meaning and stated that the verse refers to certain salah of the five compulsory salah. That some they have stated that it refers to some of the salah during the day and the night, especially at these timings. They have stated that before the rising of the sun in the verse refers to the performance of the Fajr salah, and before its setting refers to the Asr salah. Regarding this, Jarir bin Abdullah narrates, We were once with the Prophet wasallam when he looked at the moon on a full moon night. Upon that he said, Certainly you will see your Lord as you see this moon, and you will have no trouble in seeing him, that is in, on the day of judgment. So if you can avoid missing the salah before the rising of the sun, and before its setting, do so. That is, avoid missing it. If you can avoid missing the Fajr Salah and the Asr Salah, then do so. Avoid missing it. He then recited the verse which states, And glorify the praises of your Lord before the rising of the sun and before its setting. So this is one commentary, a famous commentary that is given here. That Qabla Tulu Shamsi, before the rising of the sun, it means the performance of the Fajr Salah and Qabl al ghurub before the Satin refers to Asr Salah. But what we must understand that the ayah is general and the ayah, it actually includes both things. Why? Because in uh, practicing upon the law of this ayah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did two things. He used to at that time make a lot of zikr and the tasbih of Allah at this time in the morning and even after performing the Fajr Salah and also after Asr, that is before Maghrib, he will engage in doing, besides the Salat, he will engage himself in doing a lot of the Dhikr and the Tasbih of Allah. So therefore, it refers to both things. So it cannot be said that it refers to Salah alone and it cannot be said that Dhikr alone because that is the time for these two great and important Salah. Surah Qaf states in verse 40, so it goes further and says, And during a part of the night also glorify his praises. And so likewise after sujood. So this is connected to the verse before where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ And this verse says now, what, uh, uh, after saying, And glorify the, the praises of your Lord, and it gives the timing of before the rising of the sun and the setting. And Allah says further, وَمِنَ layli, The Arabic there, وَمِنَ layli, And from the night, فَسَبِّحُ And glorify him also. And from the night, فَسَبِّحُ Glorify him also. And when? وَأَدْبَارَ sujood. And at the end of the sujood, meaning and after sujood. So these are two more timings that are given there. Two more timings. One is what? Mina layl. And during the period of the night, Allah says, what do we do? Fasabihu and glorify him also. Wa adbara sujood. Yani wa ba'da sujood. Sujood means your prostration and after your prostration, at the end of your prostration, that's the other time. What's the commentary? What does it refer to? As the word itself says, and it, it indicates to praising and glorifying Allah in the night and also after you perform your salat, that is after you complete your prostrations and you do your sujood. So as it goes in the commentary, it states in the commentary, the above verse is a continuation of the instruction which is given in verse 39 along with the timings which are mentioned before where the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the believers are instructed by Allah to glorify him before the rising of the sun and before its setting. Allah further orders them, that's all the believers, including the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah further in orders them in this verse to do the same in a part of the night and also after sujood. The word sujood is the plural of the word sajda, which literally means prostration. In this verse, the general body of the commentators of the Holy Quran have stated that it refers to the completion of salat means that and and make the dhikr of allah 
after the completion of salah. Doesn't literally mean when you do a sajda, you make it. We know we have to do the dhikr and the tasbih and sajda, but here it refers to something else. After you have completed salah, then Allah is saying at that time, you praise and glorify Allah also. With respect to the instruction of glorifying Allah in a part of the night, because the Quran says, Wa min al fa The exegetes, that, that's the expert commentators of the Holy Quran, have stated that when it states and uh, praise and glorify Allah in part of the night, it refers to performing the salah of Maghrib and Isha, because this is a part of the night. So mention was made about uh, uh, before sun, sunrise and, and, and before sunset and now min al layl part of the night and that part of the night is what? Maghrib and Isha or the tahajjud salah and any other salah of the night. So it includes wa min al layli and at night glorify Allah it also includes the tahajjud salah because that is in the night or any other uh, nafil salah you will do at the night during the night it is also included in this abdullah bin abbas radiallahu ta'ala who has stated that it refers to the perform to to the to performing the two sunnah rakats of the fajr salah some commentators have stated that it can also refer to doing the tasbih and the dhikr of allah during the night so we see here that all these different meanings are mentioned because the salah of the night is wa min al layl that is during the night praise allah glorify allah in salah and also commentators have stated it refers to doing the tasbih and the dhikr of allah during the period of the night also then another thing was mentioned here allah says wa adbar as sujood and glorify allah at the end of the sujood, that's the end of the prostration, which means after sujood or we have seen here, it means after the completion of salat. So the shara and the commentary states as for glorifying Allah after or at the end of the sujood prostrations, the commentators of the Holy Quran have also given varying explanations, all of which are accepted. The great companions like Umar and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhuma and the expert tabi'in scholars like Hassan Basri, Amir al-Sha'bi and the great scholar Ibrahim bin Yazid al naqi alayhimu rahma and Imam al-Awzai alayhi rahma have stated that to glorify Allah after the sujood means to perform the two rakats after salah al Al Maghrib, because it was connected to what the night. One min al layli fasabehu wa adbar al sujud, and in a period of the night glorify Allah, and also after sajja. So they are of the opinion that wa adbar al sujud is connected to one min al layl, to the glorification of Allah in the night, which refers to Maghrib salat. So they are of the opinion that it refers to after the three farz of Maghrib salat, the two sunnah that are there, it is like praising and glorifying Allah after you have completed your salah of Maghrib, uh, you know, in, in according to this opinion. This is also mentioned in a narration from Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma in which he stated that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said two rakats after salah al-maghrib is the salah after as-sujood. So that is mentioned in the tradition here. Some commentators have stated that it means to perform optional salah on nawafil after the far salah which includes performing two rakats after every obligatory salah Regarding this, it is narrated from Ali radiallahu ta'ala that he said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to perform two rakats of salah after every far salah except that of fajr and asr salah. So besides fajr and asr salah, if we look at our five time salat, we will see that after the far salah, there are rakats of salah which we may term sunnah, al-mu'akkada or ghayr al-mu'akkada or nawafil. So therefore, we by performing salah, the believers go further to glorify Allah and to make the tasbih of Allah and remember Allah in this salah. So they have done their duty by the far salah. For example, they have done their duty in the zuhr salah. And after doing their duty by performing the four farz of zuhr salat, they add other salat after that. That is adbar sujood according to this commentary. That is the 
glorification of Allah after sujood. And sujood here will refer to the completion of the first salat. The same thing occurs in the Maghrib salah. After one finishes the three farz of Maghrib, he then adds his two sunnah. Which means that he goes on to glorify Allah even after there were three farz, which is what Allah mandated him to do. And the same thing is with the Isha. So this is one commentary. Some scholars have also stated that it refers to the performance of the Witr Salah, which is prescribed after the obligatory Salah of Isha and before the Fajr Salah. That it refers to the Witr because after you finish your Isha Salah, and before you can begin your Fajr Salah during the period of the night, you perform this. So it is as if you are glorifying and praising Allah after you have completed your sujood in the Isha Salat and your prostrations. The great Tabi'i exegete and expert scholar Mujahid alayhi rahma explains that glorifying Allah, that is doing the tasbih as instructed in the verse after the sujood means to do the tasbih with the tongue after the compulsory for salat which everybody does or most people do it is narrated by abu huraira radiallahu ta'ala that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever does the tasbih of allah that is they say subhanallah after every salat 33 times and does the takbir of Allah, that is, they say Allahu Akbar 33 times. And that person praises Allah, that they say Alhamdulillah 33 times, which all together makes 99. And then, in order to complete 100, says the following La ilaha illallah wahdahu, la sharika la, lahul mulku, wa lahul hamdu, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Then all his mistakes and sins shall be forgiven, even if they are like the foam of the sea, subhanallah. Even if they are like the foam of the sea. This is a hadith which is recorded by in Sahih Muslim. Also Imam Bukhari has narrated it and the different commentators have narrated it and mentioned it in their respective commentaries and tafsir of the Holy Quran. So we see that this also, this is something that is literal in its application in other words it's allah says he yeah, and glorify allah after your sujood and sujood here means when you have completed salah by performing your sajjah and your prostration and glorify allah and we see that this is exactly what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us about where we say the tasbih we say the takbir and we say the tahmeed that is saying subhanallah alhamdulillah allahu akbar and we can say allahu akbar in another riwayah it mentions 34 times to make up 100 or you can recite this dua to make up the 100 if you were to recite each of these uh, you know beautiful dhikr 33 times 33 33 99 and then one time but what is uh, mentioned is that you complete 100 in the dhikr of allah uh, so therefore this also subhanallah is adbaru sujood so we have both commentaries and all are accepted and all can be practiced upon and we should practice upon all in one way our salah it is mentioned here you know the timings so we do our, all our salah our five times daily salah which will be uh, yani implementing what, uh, what Allah has ordered in this ayah and further than that Allah speaks about adbaru sujood, about after sujood, and we see that it refers to nawafil salah, or sunnah salah, or witr salat, after the far salat. But along with all of that, the opinion is very strong, held by many great commentators, that it means about glorifying Allah, making the tasbih and the dhikr of Allah in the morning, in the evening, at night, and also after you have completed salat. Surah Qaf, we go to the next verse, it states, Surah Qaf states in verse 41, And listen on the day when the caller will call from a near place. It states, وَاسْتَمِعْ الْيَوْمَ يُنَادِ الْمُنَادِ And listen attentively, وَاسْتَمِعْ yani Allah is calling our attention to listen to what is going to happen. وَاسْتَمِعْ And listen attentively, يَوْمَ The day on which يُنَادِ الْمُنَادِ the caller will, will call, the announcer will make an announcement. From where? 
مما كان قريب from a very close by area يعني he will be close to you or you will be close to that caller the question is يوم refers to the day of on the day of judgment who will be the munadi who will be the caller who will be the announcer and where will you be that you will be close to him that Allah is in mimma kan in qareeb from a close by area and that's where we go into the commentary as it states in the above verse that's verse 41 Allah instructs the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the believers and by extension all others the whole mankind to listen attentively to what is mentioned about the horrors and the dreadful events of the day of judgment Allah is actually pulling our attention to this very important thing and he says listen attentively and those words are only said when something very serious is coming up after very serious is coming up after so Allah says what's the listen listen well and then Allah says yawm that day the verse states on that day a caller will call from a near place this verse refers this refers to the events on the day of judgment when the caller will call from a near place it refers to the events on the day of judgment when the trumpet shall be blown for the second time and everyone shall be resurrected they will come out from their graves at that time the angel israfil salam, will call out to the dead bodies so remember the ayah is saying and listen well on that day what will happen the caller will call out from a near place who the caller will be as it is mentioned here israfil salam. besides sounding the trumpet or blowing the trumpet he will make a call also he will call out the people so some commentators have stated also that angel israfil salam, will blow the trumpet and angel jibrail salam, will call out to the bodies now this is the this this eye is speaking about the second sounding of the trumpet the second blowing of the trumpet what is clearly evident in many of the uh, the ahadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and these things have been mentioned in the books of usuluddin the books of aqaid is that there will be two sounding of the trumpet the blowing of the trumpet the first time the trumpet will be blown by Israfil salam, it is to bring about destruction of the universe to bring about the destruction of the universe when the, he will sound it every living thing yani every single thing that is living at that time will perish will be destroyed they will actually be dead and after a long time Allah will order angel Israfil alayhi salam to blow the trumpet again. The second blowing, it is at a time when people will already be dead. The entire, all living beings will be dead. People will be beneath the earth, buried by the dirt, covering them if they died at a time when, you know, uh, the, the, the first trumpet was sounded, then, you know, after a long while things will cover them or they will be uh, such that they have died and were actually buried from a long time before so when the second trumpet is being blown they are already dead and it is the second trumpet the sound of the second trumpet will wake them up from their graves so therefore two things will happen based on this ayah here and this commentary which is given in the uh, in the front of Seer. The angel Israfil salam, will blow the trumpet to revive the bodies and a call will be made to summon the people you know for the reckoning. So according to this uh, commentary here it says an angel Jibreel salam, will call out to the bodies. The great exegete and expert scholar from among the tabi in Maqatil alayhi rahma says angel Israfil alayhi salam will call out to the bodies for gathering so most of the narrations and the explanations show that it is angel Jibreel, uh, Israfil alayhi salam who will call out and what will the call be he will make an announcement and everybody in their graves will hear it he will say the angel will say oh decompose the bodies oh decomposed bones 
fragmented limbs and dislocated joints, O oh, detached flesh and scattered hairs, verily Allah has ordered you to gather for reckoning and judgment. Allah has ordered you to gather for reckoning and judgment. This is the call that will be made to everybody. The verse states, that is what is mentioned in Tafsir al baghwi The verse states, the caller will call from a near place. With respect to what is referred to as a near place, some commentators have stated that it means that the sound of the trumpet and the call shall be heard by everyone near and far in such a manner that it will, it will be as if it is very close to everyone. No one will be far from that call. Ikrima alayhi rahma explains that the caller will call out to everyone in such a manner that it will be as if he is announcing the call into his ears. In other words, the call will be made, the call that is given here where he will call out to all the composed bones, fragmented limbs and dislocated joints and it will go on. It will be made by the angel but the sound and the voice will be heard by every single person even though he is literally and physically far from where the angel is. He will hear it so loud it will be as if he's next to the angel, although he might be far. This is what it means by saying, Mim makan in qareeb, from a close place. So it will reach everybody, even people might be miles and miles away. The voice will reach into the ears of the people as if they were next to the angels. So this is what it, you know, is, is, is actually explained as Mim makan in qareeb. Some commentators of the Holy Quran have stated that the near place mentioned in the verse refers to the rock at Masjid al-Aqsa, since it is that part of the earth which is closest to the heaven. Jibreel alayhi salam or Israfil alayhi salam will stand on that rock at Masjid al-Aqsa Aqsa, and call out to the bodies for the gathering. So, according to this opinion, because this whole world will change, this earth will change. The Quran says, on that day, this whole earth will be transformed. It will be transformed into a new earth and reckoning will take place. Reckoning will take place. People will come out from their graves. So where their graves are, think about it. The graves are there, which we can see. They will be coming out from their graves. So where would they be? on this earth, but it will be changed into a new way, a new format. You wouldn't have trees and you wouldn't have houses and you wouldn't have mountains and you wouldn't have oceans. It will be changed, subhanAllah. So the angel will stand at the, at the rock of Masjid al-Aqsa according to this very important and great commentary given by Imam Qurtubi. The rock is the rock when the Prophet wasallam wanted to go up into the heavens then the rock went up with him and he ordered the rock to remain there. And that rock is still there until today. So that is the rock the angel Israfil alayhi salam or Jibreel alayhi salam will stand up and they will make an announcement and every dead creature, being and body will hear that as if the angel is next to him or her. What will the angel say? Israfil alayhi salam or, or, or Jibreel alayhi salam, they will say, O oh, decomposed bones, fragmented limbs and dislocated joints. O oh, decayed bones and obliterated shrouds. O oh, empty hearts, rotten bodies and O oh, flowing eyes. Arise in front of the Lord of the worlds. Arise for reckoning. Arise for the judgment. And arise for accounting as the narrations go further. So it goes to show that this is from among that which will occur and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning these things in the last verses of Surah Qaf, bringing the scene of the day of judgment and the occurrences of that day before our eyes so we will know what is ahead of us, what is real and what will actually happen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make that day easy for us. So we have come to the end of today's uh, class, uh, this course. We will, we will close there and inshallah we'll continue next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.